Hello and welcome. My name is Stacey Bersani, Program Manager for IEEE Ada Kakanu. IEEE is the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. We thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, please note a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are engagement tools for you to use. All tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to make the most out of your space. Note that we recommend using a wired internet connection to access today's presentation and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. There is no dial-in number for this event. Please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so that you can hear our presenters. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues by clicking, I'm sorry, by clicking the orange question mark help icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any question for today's presenters, you can submit them through the Q&A widget on your screen or click the purple Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions as time allows. If you click the green resources icon at the bottom of your screen, you'll find more information about today's event. Finally, the on-demand link for today's event will be emailed to all registrants. Our virtual event today is an X Factor conversation with Martin Cooper, father of the cell phone father and an HKN phone. eminent member. During this session, he will speak with SK Ramesh, the 2016 IEEE HKN president, HKN student governor Joseph Green, and former student governor Caitlin Brinker about his invention that literally changed the way society communicates. If you would like to post on Facebook about this event, please use the hashtags I am HKN and eight and X Factor. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to IEEE HKN Director, Nancy Oston. Well, thank you so much, Stacey, and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, uh, wherever you are in the world. So it's so great to be here. Um, the X Factor conversations have been um, a highlight of what we've been doing recently, highlighting our eminent members, and I'm so happy to have Marty with us today. Um, Marty, we met a couple couple times around um, around the technology world, and you truly are a gentleman. It's uh, great to have you with us. I get to introduce um, SK Ramesh, who's going to take us to be our, our moderator for today. I'm going to introduce Joe and, and Katie, so um, I'm going to let you take it away. And welcome, Etta Kapanu. Thank you so much. Uh, good day, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, ladies and gentlemen in the world, listening to this broadcast. Uh, as you heard today, we've got uh, a great session ahead of you. Uh, I first want to briefly introduce uh, my co-host today. Uh, Katie Brinker is a doctoral student at Iowa State University and a former member of the Ada Kapanu Board of Governors. She was student governor from Gamma Theta. And uh, Joe Green is from Boston University, a uh, doctoral student himself with Kappa Sigma, uh, and a current member of the HKN Board of Governors. Uh, Katie is also the co-chair of our Public Relations and Communications Committee. Uh, before I introduce our honored guest today, Marty Cooper, uh, just a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, think about a world today where we do not have a cell phone. It's inconceivable, isn't it? The invention that Marty Cooper came up with in 1973, the Dynatac, Dynamic Adaptive Total Area Coverage, the first mobile phone that he and his team created in April 1973, is one of those inventions that's truly transformed humanity. I first uh, met Marty in uh, uh, 2013 when he was inducted into Ada Kappa Nu as an eminent member. He was already an Ada Kappa Nu member back in 1950 in the Delta chapter from IIT Chicago, but he was uh, uh, recognized as an eminent member, the 134th eminent member of uh, Ada Kappa Nu. Uh, when you read a story, and I highly recommend you pick up a copy of Cutting the Cord by Marty Cooper, one of the most inspiring books that I've ever read uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, in terms of innovation, and in terms of just sheer courage to overcome the various obstacles and come out with this invention that's truly transformed our life. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, inducted in 2013, a recipient of the Draper Prize, the Marconi Prize, uh, Consumer Electronics Hall of Fame, 
and as far as IEEE is concerned, a former president of the Vehicular Technology Society. And Marty, we last met in Torrey Pines in your neck of the woods in 2016. Great to see you. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. It's an honor to be here, Ramesh. Wonderful. Really, really looking forward to chatting with you, Marty. The last year has been really surreal, hasn't it? You know, with COVID-19 and the challenges that have come our way. And uh, people have been talking about the future of engineering. And I started thinking about it and I said, you know, really, it's not about the future of engineering, but it's engineering the future. And a couple of lines from your book came to mind and, and really struck a chord in my, uh, in my mind. People connect with people, not places. People are inherently and naturally and fundamentally mobile. And then I started juxtaposing that with IEEE's mission, advancing technology for humanity. That, Marty, to me, seems more relevant at this point in our history than ever before, the confluence of entrepreneurship and humanitarian activities. And you, Marty, have been a champion of innovation throughout your legendary career. So I think we'd begin, we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on how we can develop this sort of entrepreneurial mindset. So tell us a little bit about your story. Well, first of all, I, I ought to say, uh, Ramesh, that entrepreneurship is not for everybody because uh, it, it, it is uh, risky. And the, the only way that you can encourage people to be entrepreneurs is to make sure they understand that uh, failure uh, is is not something to be ashamed of. Failure, uh, when you're a researcher, an entrepreneur, even an engineer, uh, is is a learning experience. Now, I know you can carry that too far, uh, because if you're an engineer building a bridge, uh, I'm not sure failure is a very good learning experience. But uh, I was really fortunate uh, when I uh, uh, got out of the uh, the U.S. Navy uh, and went to work, uh, that uh, my second job was at Motorola. I ended up staying there for 29 years. Uh, and the founder of Motorola, when he founded Motorola, actually, uh, uh, the, the company was his third effort. Uh, his first effort, uh, I'm not sure I remember. For, oh, it was a, uh, it was a battery eliminator. Uh, that didn't, somehow didn't work out. Uh, uh, because, you know, at that time, uh, cars didn't even have a, a, a battery, nor did they have a heater. So he came up with a heater for cars, uh, and uh, uh, the, car, the heater started out being very successful, and he sold a lot of them until they started exploding, uh, upon which he was no longer in the heater business, but he was undaunted and put a radio in the car, and, of course, that was the foundation of what, uh, became a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, he lived that philosophy uh, and Motorola uh, uh, adopted it extraordinarily well uh, and they tolerated me for 29 years because I had my share of failures. But the reason that I had those failures is that I was never afraid. I knew that one way or another uh, people would understand and taking a chance was the only way that you could do things that were different and hard. So uh, I guess the answer to your question is uh, create an environment where people understand that failure can be a learning experience. It's not, not a pleasant one, uh, but you, you do learn and there is always the opportunity to come back. Well, very well said, Marty. And, you know, one of the other things that I read about you that, uh, that was inspirational to me is uh, this notion that it's not a sprint, but it's really a marathon. You're an avid marathoner, aren't you? Well, I was until my knees started giving me a, a lot of trouble, and, uh, and I was a skier as well. And, and, and my uh, philosophy, you, you know, they have this concept, if, uh, for those of you that are runners, about pacing yourself, making sure you don't burn out. Uh, I had one philosophy when I was a runner, and that was run as fast as I can all the time. So uh, it, it, I'm not sure it was the most effective, but uh, I didn't start running until I was uh, in my late 40s. Uh, and uh, somehow I managed uh, to be a, a, a winner in my class uh, always, uh, with, uh, 
I'm not sure I would have done very well running against uh, 18-year-olds. <laughs> I'm sure you would have done brilliantly, uh, Marty, you know, having been inducted into Delta Theta 1950. I want to transition to uh, uh, our two co-hosts here, Katie and Joe. And I know, uh, Katie, you want to kick us off with uh, a question? Sure. Um, so one of my questions is, how can both students and young professionals develop the confidence to pursue their ideas? If they have an idea for a new invention or a new pursuit, how, how can we be developing our confidence to be able to, to take that risk and go for it? Well, first of all, uh, just because I've uh, managed to survive for 92 years doesn't mean that I have the answers uh, to all the uh, questions. But uh, uh, there's no other way to build uh, confidence than to attempt things, to try them. Uh, and when they don't work, try other things. Uh, if you, uh, you know, I just have to keep repeating uh, what Paul Galvin said. Reach out, do not fear failure. Uh, if you keep trying, uh, you find out that sooner or later you do get results. Uh, and I found that out very early uh, because even when I was a child, I still have memories of when I was four or five years old uh, trying things out. The first thing I tried out is when I saw uh, some yo youngsters, youngsters meaning uh, older uh, boys with a magnifying glass who were burning paper. And I thought that was just an incredible thing. And I just had to do that. Of course, I didn't have a magnifying glass, but I found a, an old uh, Coke bottle and broke the bottom because it looked like a magnifying glass. But they uh, didn't do very well. And that was my first failure, uh, at least first that I remember, and I was undaunted. Keep trying uh, and, and uh, regard failures as learning experiences. And when you start getting successes, you start building confidence. I have to say that if you don't have those successes, uh, maybe you're in the wrong job. Uh, but my experience is uh, that, the, uh, that trying things out and uh, being persistent uh, is the most important thing uh, in uh, uh, doing creative endeavors. Great. Thank you. Joe, do you have a question? Yeah, for sure. First and foremost, hi, Marty. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to come and talk with us. Even though we just got started, I can tell it's going to be a very enlightening hour talking with you. So based off of the previous questions, I wanted to dive into your mentality as an innovator a little bit and see if we can get some insights for our audience, which is mostly students and young professionals, about some key practices that they can start working towards to build a successful career, whether they decide to become an entrepreneur or not. Um, one, one question I had in mind is in the prelude of your book, you talk a lot about how you were inspired by the story of the radio visionary, Guillermo Marconi, who was looked down upon by others in his scientific community in his early career. However, through a passion for learning and bold vision, he was able to realize the revolutionary experiment that proved you could send electromagnetic waves a long distance. Can you talk about how this passion for learning and bold vision affected your career path and how we can foster these traits during our early engineering career? I don't know how you uh, create this uh, feeling that I have in other people. But I have to tell you that the, uh, even now, the, the most uh, thrilling experience I have is to get some facts, have somebody teach me something, and I learn from virtually everybody that I talk to, and have a new way of looking at something. That mm -hmm. is the most thrilling uh, experience that I have. And if, if I would advise anybody that doesn't experience that to reach out uh, and look for something uh, to do something different. Uh, Marconi was a, a very good example, although I didn't find out about Marconi until uh, relatively recently. Of course, recently for me is anything in the last 25 years, yeah, but we all have our different viewpoints. Uh, but uh, Marconi uh, was educated as an engineer. Uh, he is celebrated as an inventor. And the bottom line, he really wasn't uh, a great engineer, nor was he a great inventor, uh, but he was persistent, and he had a vision, and his vision was 
that this curiosity that, that you could cause things to happen at a distance could be made useful, could become a communications tool. And he decided he was going to show the world that this could be done. Uh, and he hired people to do that. And when he had a failure, he tried again and again and again and never really understood how radio worked. But he managed to, to create a big enough spark. And that literally is what, what Marconi's first communication was. It was a spark that occurred uh, with a, a, a huge generator that, that did nothing but generate a voltage uh, that, that was turned into a spark that was tied onto an antenna that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it was two telephone poles uh, with 100 yards of wire. I don't think he had any idea of what, of what he was doing <laughs> other than how oh, that seemed to work. Uh, and, uh, and he was listening uh, uh, across the ocean, uh, listening for an, an SOS. Uh, there are people that dispute that he ever heard it, uh, but somehow he heard it, and that became the basis of a business, and he formed the Marconi Company, and it was successful enough uh, to do a couple of important things. One is it saved uh, many hundreds of lives on the Titanic, because a Marconi operator uh, did, in fact, uh, alert other ships in the region where the Titanic sank. Uh, the other thing it did, it generated enough money so that he uh, owned a huge yacht, uh, which, he named, <laughs> which he named the Elettra. Uh, I was fortunate enough, if you read my book, you can see a picture of the Princess Electra, his daughter, that he, I don't know whether he named the boat after his daughter or his daughter after the boat, but that's unimportant. But, uh, but he was the ultimate entrepreneur. He just, uh, uh, he just kept trying and trying until he made it happen. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I guess the punchline there is find find what you're passionate about. Don't be afraid to try and try not to electrocute yourself in any harebrained experiments. So thank you so much, Marty. You got it, Joe. If, if, if you don't get a thrill out of thinking <laughs> and learning, then go do something else because you're entitled to that. I feel so sorry for people that get into a rut and, uh, and uh, lose the ability to learn. And the reality is that if you stop learning, and this has been measured by, uh, the, uh, by psychologists, that if you stop learning for even a year or two, you do that deliberately, you lose the ability. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything more scary. Wow. So Thank you so was, much. Yeah. Thank Go you. Ahead, Thank you, Jer. Yeah. So Marty, as I was uh, reflecting on your response right here on the role of innovation, and this is something you're very familiar with from the National Academy of Engineering, uh, changing the conversation back in 2008. And I'll just read a brief paragraph here. No profession unleashes the spirit of innovation like engineering. From research to real-world applications, engineers are constantly discovering how to improve our lives by creating bold new solutions that connect science to life in unexpected forward-thinking ways. Few professions turn so many ideas into so many realities, and few have such a direct and positive impact on people's everyday lives. We are counting on engineers and their imaginations uh, to help us meet the needs of the 21st century. So I pivoted to your book, and one of the things that struck me is your belief and commitment in the social value of the technologies that you're creating, Marty, to inspire the next generation of young people to be curious, never stop learning, to dream like you did, and find ways to solve, as you say, some of the material and environmental problems of society. And there was one episode that really, you know, close to my heart. I'm originally from India, and you talked about uh, uh, this entrepreneur, as he is today, mother of Krishna, and his... Uh, uh, app or uh, uh, company, Vahan, which is uh, the, the one that he uses to help farmers in the country, it's been instrumental in reducing poverty in that part of the world. So can you talk a little bit about uh, you know, that aspect, the, the, the impact that innovation has and will continue to have in addressing the challenges that confront us? Well, uh, uh... I, do you remind me of what that quotation that you just 
uh, delivered. Where did that come from? So that was from Changing the Conversation, Marty. It's a book that uh, the National Academies of Engineering uh, produced. Yeah. At that time, there was a concern about attracting students uh, to the STEM fields in general. Yep. Well, uh, uh, the, the quotation you made to express it, although they spent a lot more time uh, saying it than, uh, than the way I express it. Uh, but uh, I define technology, and you could use the word innovation as well, uh, as the application of science to create products and services that make people's lives better. Uh, without the people part, it, uh, these things are just a curiosity. Uh, and yet, all of the problems of the world uh, are can be solved by applying science. And that's all that engineering is. Uh, and, and what higher purpose can anybody have in life than to make it the lives of, of people better. So I don't think engineers get nearly the credit, and nor do they get the opportunity that they uh, are entitled to, to fix problems. Uh, I am devastated by the fact that our uh, uh, U.S. Congress uh, has one engineer uh, uh, among uh, literally hundreds of representatives of, of the people. Now, the reality is that when a new name a problem, you apply an engineering solution, and sooner or another, sooner or later, the problem will get solved. But uh, only if you take a scientific approach, uh, an engineering approach. And uh, by the way, I, I'm uh, evolving into uh, uh, a higher level way of looking at this. We are we engineers really are designers. We are look. We start out with a human problem. The beginning is always people. It's always humans, uh, and design what we hope will be the optimum solution, but will solve uh, that kind of a problem. Uh, that is to me. Uh, I can't think of a of a higher uh, purpose in in life, uh, and, and the example that you gave. Uh, Ramesh uh, is just one of many, many. Uh, I, and the, the best way that I can express that is to uh, examine what has happened with the cell phone. Uh, if you look uh, in the developed countries, uh, we are still in the game stage with the cell phone. Uh, the people use the cell phone for things like uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, so, uh, social media, and various uh, other things. Uh, that are useful, but only in an indirect way. The, the real people improving applications of a cell phone are in places like India, Mexico, uh, Africa. Uh, Africa being an even better example than India because uh, the problems there are even uh, worse. Uh, and I talk a lot of, in my book about what has happened in, in Africa where the cell phone has become a, a instrument of survival that, that, that uh, uh, over a billion people have moved out of severe poverty uh, because of what we in the developed countries uh, consider to be uh, trivial, the ability to move money around, to save money, uh, to move money from one place to another. And that thing that is trivial in our society uh, has moved over a billion people out of severe poverty. That's astounding to me. So uh, uh, I, I have a belief, and I try to express that in the book as well, uh, that uh, given the opportunity uh, and the resources that we uh, engineers can solve any problem, we can't just cure disease, we can eliminate disease. We can't just right. move people out of severe poverty. We can eliminate poverty. There are the resources. We are so efficient, so inefficient. Boy, did I get that backwards. We are so inefficient at everything that we do that there is the opportunity not only to solve these problems, but to totally eliminate the problems and only discuss uh, what the uh, uh, real advantages of living are.
Wonderful, Sorry for that. And, you know, one of the uh, principles of Ada Kappa Nu is service to humanity, scholarship, character, and attitude. And as you were talking about uh, the, our representatives in Congress, uh, I think you'd be delighted to know that our U.S. Congressman Tony Cardenas was someone whom I personally uh, inducted into the Lambda Beta chapter here at uh, Cal State Northridge in 2015. He's a graduate from Santa Barbara, an electrical engineer. And of course, we have a U.S. Senator now, also from California, uh, Alex Padilla, who's a mechanical engineer from MIT. So we're growing. We're coming. <laughs> uh, well, that's 100 percent improvement, I think. <laughs> I think that's amazing. Fabulous. Katie and Joe, uh, can we look at the audience uh, uh, panel to see if we have questions? I know there's a lot of questions coming yeah. in. Yes, definitely. Yeah, there's there's a ton of questions here. So uh, to kick it off, here's one. Uh, what do you think will be the next game changer in wireless communications? Is it 5G? Is it LEO con constellations? Or, you know, what do you think will be the next big thing? Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned 5G because uh, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question directly. Because, uh, if, but I do want to talk about uh, 5G. I think the next big thing uh, is a revolution in education. Uh, I think, and I hope uh, that the educators who are uh, on this call don't take offense at my comment, uh, because these educators have uh, worked with the tools that they had available to them. But now that we have the ability to have every student have access to all the knowledge in the world, but only if that student happens to have uh, availability of uh, uh, access to the internet. Broadband access is what that means. Uh, and I would suggest it has to be wireless broadband access. Well, we've got a huge engineering problem to make that happen. Uh, and that is the fact that even in an advanced country like the US, 40% uh, of our students do not have access to wireless broadband adequate enough for them to be educated. We've got to solve that problem, because just imagine uh, if we don't solve it, that a class of students that don't have access to the Internet will not be challenged in their studies as much as the other students they will not have access to the same information. Their brains will not grow as quickly. And, and by growing brains, I'm talking about and not the size, but the you know, number of interconnections that they've got in their brains. And we end up with a two-class society. That is absolutely unacceptable. We have to figure out how to solve that problem. And interestingly enough, there are engineering solutions. The difficulty that we've got in this specific problem uh, is that the people that control the radio uh, spectrum, uh, that control the systems that bring the uh, these services to uh, everybody that can solve this problem are lawyers, politicians, uh, and business people. The engineers have yet to be challenged in this area because, believe it or not, there are engineering solutions to that problem. There are the concept, and Ramesh, I'm getting out of hand, but you stop me when, we, when I get too far out of hand. <laughs> uh, we, we have a concept that uh, is out of control, and that is you can build something, a service, a product that is universal, that does all things for all people. And my belief is that when you come up with such a product, it doesn't do any of those things optimally. So, Kathy, when you brought up 5G, you really uh, uh, pulled the trigger on one of, one of my hot buttons. Uh, 5G is, is great. Uh, it, it, uh, re it addresses the Internet of Things. It's my view that we haven't finished yet with the Internet of People. And, and 5G does not address the Internet of People very well. 5G uh, provides super high speeds, low latency uh, uh, features uh, like slicing that are valuable for making factories, for running robots, but are not addressed to people. What we people want is universal coverage, meaning wherever you are and whatever you can afford 
you can have access to wireless internet uh, and uh, with uh, adequate speeds, but at costs that we can afford. Here we are talking about uh, 5G, 6G, uh, and we haven't yet executed 1G for a big segment of our population. That is a problem, uh, and we are going to solve that problem, uh, but uh, we are slower at it than I would hope we could be. Right. Got lots of great questions coming in. Uh, so I'm, I'm letting uh, my partners in crime here, Joe and Katie, help me sort through those because it's hard to pick them. So who wants to go next? Yeah, sure. I can ask one. So uh, first to follow up, thank you so much for your feedback on that question, Marty. That was a brilliant point and call to arms for us as future innovators and engineers to get together and think more about the societal impact of our technologies versus the technological advancements itself. I think that's an incredibly poignant point we should keep in mind, but not to get too far off trap, we've had a couple of questions now from both faculty and engineering students asking very similar questions to synergize some of them together. My question for you is, what do, we, what do you consider are the crucial skills that faculty should be teaching and students should be learning from our engineering curriculum to keep up with the fast paced innovation of our modern world? And also a similar question, how did college help you achieve your incredible invention? Wow. <laughs> We only have a, a half hour. <laughs> yeah. I could spend hours and hours talking about that. And for, first of all, I, I'm not qualified to tell the uh, faculty members uh, on this uh, call how to change their teaching things. But I think they know that the concept of, a, of an instructor, and I'll use that word uh, rather than, than a professor, uh, standing in front of a group and giving people information uh, is uh, a, a no longer a valid way of teaching. They're talking mm -hmm. to people that have access to, to more information than they could, they could ever deliver, and whether it's in an hour uh, or a semester. So the nature of what a teacher uh, uh, does has to change and maybe regress, maybe go back to the way uh, the uh, Aristotle and Plato did. And the teachers ought to be asking questions. They ought to be counseling uh, the students on um, how to use these modern tools. They ought to be accommodating the fact that every person is different from every other person and that every person, therefore, may learn differently than other people. This is, these are hard teaching problems. You can call them engineering problems, but I think that there's an opportunity for the uh, the teachers, professors, to, to adapt to the new technology and uh, learn how to connect people to all the knowledge in the world in a way that it helps them grow. Uh, I was uh, really lucky, and I have to tell you with luck, nothing in my life is planned. I don't, I don't uh, uh, suggest that as a philosophy for anybody uh, because I was very lucky. And I hope the rest of you uh, are planners and do things in a much more deliberate way. Uh, and I, but I have been so lucky. Uh, I, from, the, from that time that I had that magnifying glass experience, I knew I was going to be some kind of, of an engineer. And so uh, when I had to go to high school, I went to a technical school. Uh, what I didn't realize that this was a trade school. Uh, and, and every semester in that trade school, I learned a different trade. Uh, we, we had wood shop, print shop, forage, foundry. I learned how to work with every material, with every kind of tool. And amazingly enough, the, the, uh, the social studies were as effective in my school as they would have been in a liberal arts school. The only place I missed out was language. Uh, and that was my choice, and it was a dumb uh, decision that I made. But uh, uh, once again, I, it was luck that I went to that school. And then I went to the Illinois Institute of Technology, which is uh, still today an extraordinary school. And the, the philosophy of that school was uh, to teach things 
uh, in an entrepreneurial mode, in a, in a practical mode. They still did all of the theoretical classes that you could imagine, uh, but somehow or other, there are always classes that related the learnings that we had to the real world. Uh, and so uh, is, is that the objective for everybody? I'm not certain of that. Uh, I think there is a role for researchers who try to uh, attack the, uh, the underlying uh, uh, understanding of, of, uh, of how things work. Uh, but for those who want to be engineers and entrepreneurs, uh, uh, having in mind uh, that the importance of ideas is in how they improve people's lives. So it sounds like I'm starting to repeat myself, uh, but... Uh, uh, there's, there's, there's reiteration, Marty. It's good thoughts. <laughs> so okay. we have we have another question here. Switching gears a little bit, uh, was was your inspiration for the cell phone instantaneous, or was it something that more so evolved over time and kind of morphed into something you maybe didn't expect it to? Well, as Ramesh pointed out. Uh, and I, I, I keep congratulating him because he's one of the few people that I know read the book. So uh, I, I don't believe in the Eureka moment. Uh, I believe that every decision that I've made is based upon all of the history uh, that started out uh, perhaps uh, for when I was born, certainly the influence of, of my family and especially uh, uh, my mother, but specifically <laughs> with the cell phone. Uh, the real inspiration came from the fact that I was uh, working for Motorola. Uh, I was lucky to, to uh, evolve from uh, doing research uh, to uh, working in the uh, two-way radio division. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, being uh, uh, in the two-way radio business it could have been the most boring business you could imagine. You know, I, my mother always wanted to be, uh, to be a, a lawyer or a doctor nothing more boring than being uh, uh, an engineer. So, but uh, uh, remind me again, what are, <laughs> where were we? Oh, the Eureka moment. Yes. So, uh, so it turns out that uh, uh, in the toy radio businesses, we were building uh, car phones, car, two-way radios in cars. And we were approached by the uh, superintendent of police uh, of the, in Chicago who said, I've got a problem. My problem is I have to maintain communications with my resources, with these police officers. And the only way I can do that is when they're in their cars. But the people that we're serving, the people whose problems we're solving are on the streets. I've got to get my... Uh, officers out on the streets, can you help me? And so we developed a product that allowed these police officers to sit in their cars and communicate, and they get out of their cars and continue to uh, communicate. And we observed that the whole concept of how the police serve the public changed. And then we'd go to airports and we would find out that we, we would make a uh, uh, we, we made portable devices so that people in the airports who are all moving around could stay in communications so they could manage all of their resources. And we made a pouch for them so they could put these radios uh, on their belts. <laughs> and what we discovered, and which you people all know, is people don't use those pouches. Their radios were always in their hands. <laughs> and And then we find out that the bell system comes along uh, and they uh, have got everything backwards. They start out at Bell Labs. Uh, the engineers at Bell Labs would decide what the product we wanted. Uh, they would take that product and uh, turn it over to Western Electric, part of their monopoly, uh, who would manufacture this uh, device and who would turn it over to the operating companies who would come to uh, you and say, Ramesh, this is what you wanted. Well. They've got it, they had it uh, backwards. Uh, and, and sure enough, the bell system comes along and says, we have this new technology. 
It uses spectrum very efficiently. Uh, it solves a communications problem. Uh, it lets people be mobile. And that mobility is when you're in a car. And, and we had gone past that. We had already learned that cars were useful, but only a very small part of the time and to only a very small part of the public. So it was very obvious to us that cellular phones had to be portable. Uh, and we took on, we at Motorola, the biggest company in the world. The Bell System was, by every measure, the biggest company in the world. Uh, and we told them, you got it wrong. The way to do this is with portables. Uh, and uh, the, the other lucky thing that happened to me is that when I decided that the only way we were going to survive were against the biggest company in the world was to actually demonstrate to the public that what we talked about was not some, some uh, dream, some impractical uh, idea, that it was realizable. Uh, and I knew, of course, that that was true uh, because I came out of research. I know everything that was going in every one of our laboratories. Uh, and all we had to do was find all of these things, these ideas that were in various places where the air was as uh, simple uh, as an antenna that would work at uh, do higher frequencies, a radio synthesizer that could uh, put together uh, hundreds of frequencies when we had been dealing with one or two uh, at a time, put, take all these ideas and put them together. So uh, all I did uh, with this, uh, what turned out to be an invention, was integrate a bunch of uh, other people's ideas. So and, and the beauty of, of that idea is, fits in with what I said before about how inefficient we are. Now, uh, you could be depressed about inefficiencies. I see inefficiency as being opportunity. There are so many things in the world that we can do better today uh, if only we start out with what the problems of, uh, of people are uh, and address those problems with tools that already exist. All we have to do is put them together. There has never, ever been, brace yourself, this is going to be a generalization, and as you know, all generalizations are wrong, except mine is right. <laughs> there, has, there has never been an invention that didn't depend upon other inventions. Think about that. I, you can go back to the wheel and you know that somebody had a precursor to the wheel. Uh, and, and I'm not going to go into those details. But the tools are all there. All we've got to do is put them together if we know what the problems are that we're trying to solve. So, Marty, before we jump into the next question, I just want to tell you there's a lot of alumni from the times that you were in Motorola as well as today from the Delta chapter at IIT. Some of them, you know, I saw a no name, Joe Bleschka, who was an Area G, worked with Ira Weisenfeld, says to say hello to you. Uh, they're just thrilled to see you and the incredible career that you've had. Joe, why don't you take the next question? Yeah, for sure. We have one primed right here. Um, here's a question from our audience. Do you, think, do you see projects such as SpaceX's Starlink as a sign that internet access will soon be accessible to people without it? and lower the price of it so it's more accessible nationwide or globally? Well, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, ultimately, that may be the case <clears throat> uh, that, uh, that putting satellites up uh, will be inexpensive enough to, uh, to make that happen. But I think we're a, a couple of generations away for, uh, before that happens uh, because it still costs so much to put up a, a satellite. The satellites only last so long. Uh, and they are inefficient in the sense that uh, the way we use spectrum efficiently today uh, is by lots of reuse. That's what cellular is all about, that you can uh, uh, select a, an area smaller and smaller and more and more reuse, uh, which lets us use the spectrum more and more uh, efficiently. We have yet to apply that principle uh, effectively uh, 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 in uh, uh, in places like the rural areas, we haven't yet used tools uh, like smart antennas 
and, and I, I would love to spend two or three hours explaining <laughs> how smart antennas work because I'm one of the few people that can actually tell you how smart antenna works without going into uh, algorithms and, and equations. But there are all kinds of technologies that are not being used today that are terrestrial. We don't have to go up to the to uh, uh, orbits, and, and these things are very scientific. They use uh, uh, processing speeds uh, that are, were unheard of five or ten years ago, uh, and yet we end up reducing the cost and increasing coverage. So the, I, that was a long answer. The short answer is satellites are not the answer. The answer uh, is lots of processing uh, and uh, an understanding uh, of how to reuse uh, radio spectrum. Thank you. So we still have time for a couple more questions, uh, Katie and Joe, and I know they're coming in fast and furious. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So here, here's another one. Um, how do we evaluate the social and economic impacts of the uh, communications technologies that we are currently developing, and how do we be aware of those things as we're we're designing, so that you know, hopefully, we make a positive impact with with our inventions as well. Boy, whoever asked that question, congratulations on uh, asking. A really hard question, but uh, the best way we have of, of evaluating things uh, in in our culture today uh, is uh, whether these things actually solve the problem. And the way we evaluate that is uh, with entrepreneurship. We put the uh, somebody has a solution, they put it out to society. If the problem, if the solution works. They end up, if they're lucky, they get rich. Yeah, but what they do end up solving the problem. And the way the problems get solved better and better is because we have competition and somebody comes up with a solution. Uh, somebody is always out there trying to find a better solution. Uh, and when those solutions uh, go head to head, guess who makes the decision? The people do. And and. and is the only way that I know of that ultimately solves the problem. I call that a self-optimizing system. Uh, hierarchical systems uh, work for short periods of time. You know, the, uh, the most uh, efficient system in the world is a dictatorship, uh, but of course only when I'm the di dictator. Uh, but it turns out that uh, dictatorships, uh, as we uh, all know uh, ultimately end up failing. Only self-optimizing systems uh, end up solving the problems. Uh, and uh, I only gave you one example of that, uh, and that is, uh, I guess you could call it capitalism. Uh, I am not suggesting at all uh, that uh, we don't need a social system to uh, uh, solve the problems that capitalism doesn't solve, uh, and that we're gone. We've come up with a, a system like that, and we call that democracy. Democracy is is probably the, one of the most uh, ineffectual, flawed uh, system in the world that's ever been uh, come up in the world, uh, but it happens to be the best one. Uh, and uh, we are, are lucky. Uh, in uh, uh, the U.S. and North America, that are the system that, uh, that we've come up with has been adopted worldwide and improved uh, in many, many uh, places. Uh, but uh, I, I, I hope that the idea of a self-optimizing system gets people to think a little bit uh, uh, in comparing that with hierarchical systems so you know who's going to make the decision when you come up with a product and it's not going to be some manager, it's going to be the public. So, Marty, um, uh, Bruce Eisenstein, who is the former IEEE president, and in fact responsible for what we enjoy today as IEEE Ada Kappa Nu, he was responsible for the merger of uh, Ada Kappa Nu with IEEE. He has an interesting personal question, and his question is, after that famous call that you made on 6th Avenue, can you hear me now, did you have any further conversations with Joel Engel? <laughs> 
Well, I don't want to go into that. Of course. <laughs> uh, I, I can only tell you uh, the, the one thing that I treasure about myself, since you made that a personal question, uh, is that I try to be flexible. Uh, I, tr I w accept the fact, uh, and I, I've said this so many times that, I, that I'm embarrassed about being repetition, uh, that, uh, that people make mistakes, uh, and uh, I fear uh, that Joel hasn't accepted that yet. Because the last time I had an interaction with him, we actually gave him an award, uh, and uh, his reaction to the advances to the smartphone, to the advances in smart technology was, uh, I don't think they're very important. And when I want to make a phone call, I turn my phone on and make a call, and then I turn it off. So uh, uh, Joe's Good gotten enough. stuck. He's gotten <laughs> stuck, and I feel very sorry for him. Good enough. Good enough. Um, we probably have time for, I want to say, one more question. We could squeeze two if, you're, if you do it really quickly. Katie or Joe? Yeah, sure. Uh, here's one I'm very excited about from the Q&A. Uh, how do you distinguish future scientific processes and inventions from fantasies? Well, you know, it's kind of an obvious thing. Well, it's not obvious. Uh, I am a science fiction uh, addict, and, and uh, always have been. Uh, and what's interesting about the people that have predicted the future, uh, the, the people that are least competent at predicting the future uh, are the ordinary people. And, and, and I don't mean ordinary uh, in a, a derogatory way. I mean people that are in the arts and uh, they don't have the privilege of being engineers like all of us on this call. Uh, the, the next category are uh, more educated people, people that are uh, engineers. And you ask an engineer to predict the future, and he draws a curve. Uh, and the, the next category are people that are doing research that are a much more open mind. It turns out when you compare the curves that, that these categories have uh, with uh, the science fiction writers, the science fiction writers are always more accurate than the others. So I think we need people that are that uh, look at at fantasy. And the only distinction between fantasy and reality uh, is how far you push science. Uh, and b believe it or not, the the one of the documents that I read regularly is astounding. Science fact and fiction it used to be a astounding science fiction, uh, and they have articles that that talk about space travel that are scientific articles that are reach out far beyond what we called science fiction twenty or thirty years ago. So uh, I think uh, fantasy has a role uh, in stimulating people. To come up with answers that are not obvious, and and that happens to be a big hunk of what the future answers are going to be. Uh, I think we could solve the climate change problem as an example, and I I know there are short-term solutions and, and solutions that we're working on. I believe that the real solutions to climate change are inventions that haven't been made yet, using science that is right at the forefront. And those are the things that are going to make the world uh, inhabitable indefinitely. So if there is a message that I would deliver that, uh, that uh, supersedes everything we talked about now, uh, we have to be optimistic. We have to know that we are inefficient at what we do today, but we have always solved the problems uh, in the past, but science has continued to come up with new solutions, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things, new ways of solving problems. And that's going to keep happening. Uh, and all we have to do is persevere. Great. So, Samadhi, I think that's, that's a great point on which to ask you this closing question that I've been thinking about. And, you know, I, I was reading, and you said you dream, because you said that's what I do all the time. And you say technology's capacity to change the world for the better just keeps expanding. 
And I thought about two things that you said today, Marty, in terms of transforming education, because we have a lot of students, a lot of faculty, a lot of practicing engineers on the call. And the two things stand out, affordable wireless connectivity, real world problem solving. So uh, this is gonna be a two part question. You can answer it whichever way you want. If you were to have a time machine, Marty, and go back to 1950, when you were inducted into the Delta chapter, what would Marty Cooper tell Marty Cooper's younger self, and the same time machine transport you 50 years into the future. I'd love to see what you see, Marty. Over to you. Wow. Boy, you were, you were creative. Uh, Ramesh, I hate to disappoint you, uh, but uh, if you haven't figured out by now, I'm really happy with, with the uh, life that I've had. I have wasted so much time. I have made so many mistakes. But when I think about how I could have jump-started that, avoided those mistakes, uh, I'm not sure that I would have been the same kind of, of a person. So uh, I'm, I think I'm disappointing you. Uh, but uh, no, I don't think there would have been a big advantage for me to know in 1950 uh, what, I, uh, what I know uh, today. I don't think it would have given me uh, any advantage of along. I would have missed out on so much in my life, a lot of heartaches, uh, but a, a lot of thrills of coming up with new ideas. And they were my ideas, not some ideas that somebody jammed down my throat uh, because they thought of them be before I did. And I, I also would like to point out, when I talk about my ideas, uh, uh, I didn't suggest that those ideas were all original. Uh, a lot of my ideas, other people would consider, had them uh, decades before I did. But the, uh, the concept of coming up with a new way of looking at something that you made up, that you started, is so exciting to me. Uh, I know I'm repeating myself, yeah, but I, I wouldn't want to miss those opportunities. I don't want anybody coming in and uh, with all the knowledge in the world and telling me, Cooper, you're useless because everything that can be thought of has already been thought of and everything that's been invented has already been done. I want to see lots and lots of opportunities. And every time I see people come up with a problem, and by the way, in this whole session, I haven't talked about my wife, uh, who is a, a brilliant engineer who did not have a college education. Uh, and uh, whose ability is to identify the problems uh, and which he does continuously uh, and accurately. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she also identifies all of my problems, which I uh, would prefer she ignored. Uh, but uh, the opportunity of, of uh, being able to identify problems uh, and to see generations of problems in front of us uh, is one of the wonderful uh, opportunities that we engineers have. And, and I congratulate everybody on this call for having that opportunity. Beautifully said, Marty. And again, uh, Arlene uh, Harris is an integral part of uh, your life and the first lady of wireless, as you call her in your book. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we could be here for hours with this inspiring conversation with Marty, but I urge you to, the moment the broadcast is over, pick up a copy of Cutting the Cord by Marty Cooper, so you can read for yourself and understand. Uh, as we get to the end of our program, uh, I wanna thank you so much, Marty, for your honest, fabulous conversation today. Uh, the message is be bold, be brave, don't be afraid to fail. On behalf of IEEE Ada Cap and you, my co-hosts Katie and Joe, and the outstanding Ada Cap and you team, Nancy, Stacy, Alice, uh, everybody in IEEE, we're incredibly grateful to you for generously sharing your time and your insightful comments. I know that everyone who joined us on the call today will be walking away, Marty, confident in technology's capacity to change the world for the better, as you did, and inspired to make a difference. Uh, let me turn it over now to Nancy and Stacy. Thank you again very much for the opportunity to host this session. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, everybody. Well, again, thank you, Ramesh and Marty. It's been a pleasure having you here with us today. You truly are inspiring, I know. A lot of the Delta chapter members were texting saying, hey, Marty, shout out. We're so proud of you. 
Um, I know you mentioned that uh, student organizations, and I, I assume that was at the Capanu, meant a lot to you when you were a student. So the students today, take advantage of all those things that are available to you through Ed Cap and U and through IEEE. It really can make a difference in building your confidence. And to our alumni out there, please look to reconnect with us because we'd like to we'd like to um, make uh, you available to your experience available to other students. And if you can, if you're interested in Ed Cap and U does um, run on philanthropy. So if you're interested in supporting Ed Cap and U's mission, I encourage you to do that as well. You can always visit us our website and you. you know, we, one of these recordings, and there'll be lots of more pro great programs like this coming your way. So thanks to everyone today. Thank you for spending the afternoon with us, and have an Etta Kappa New kind of day. Bye, everyone. Ramesh, Joe, and, and uh, Kathy, and Nancy, and, and all the others, you did a magnificent job. It was a privilege for me to